in principle, gene editing means that just like you can go into a word processor and erase a word from what you've written, um, and you can change that word for a different word, uh, the technologies are beginning to allow us to go into a cell, change its internal code or vocabulary, which would be its DNA and its genome, and, um, and certainly true for a human cell, and you can switch out the word, change the word um, uh, with certain caveats. Who should we intervene on? What are the limits? Who, are, who gets to decide what normalcy versus abnormalcy is? Who gets to decide whether someone is, you know, what, what suffering is? Um, you could give an example of, for instance, of a, let's say, a terrifying uh, lethal disease. Um, which you could detect in an embryo before implanting it and decide that that's not the embryo that you want to implant. But that depends on you and I saying that's a terrifying lethal disease. Um, and that's a decision that you and I need to make, and I really mean society needs to make in consensus. Um, so it's a time to emphasize that idea um, that we're making decisions like this. Really, this issue came to a head when um, researchers in China decided to take non-viable human embryos um, and decided to try to attempt changing a, a, a disease-linked gene in that non-viable human embryo set. Um, it, they were important. It's important to note that they were non-viable in the long run, but it's also important to note but that they were indeed um, human uh, embryos uh, or very early human embryos and that the proof of principle experiment was launched. So it's, it's created a, a worldwide uh, set of questions about what we can and cannot do with the human genome. The road to eugenics was, was paved with the best intentions. And it was a series of, you can almost see the world tipping towards horror, step by step by step. You know, it seemed like one iterative step didn't seem that much. And yet, as you accumulated all of these, very soon you went from, you know, in Nazi Germany in particular, um, starting with uh, trying to uh, eliminate uh, or sterilize uh, those who um, were somehow physically uh, different from, um, from others, um, uh, all the way including uh, folks who were deaf, uh, folks who had various neurological diseases, and then sort of marched inexorably towards um, other forms of identity including obviously Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and so forth. Um, so um, it's worthwhile remembering that that progression that occurred in the 1930s um, was, was perceived by the citizens at that time as part of a progression. It was not as if, uh, you know, all of a sudden someone woke up. There was a kind of glacial silence to the progression of eugenics in Nazi Germany. And in fact, there was a glacial silence from the United States about what was going on in Nazi Germany. If anything, the you know, folks in the United States applauded, um, uh, the eugenicists in the United States applauded the efforts of Nazis, um, of Nazi scientists um, in their attempts to cleanse, the, uh, cleanse their populations of all sorts of uh, evil and emancipate themselves. So it's in incredibly important to remember that history when we step as we are going to, as we're stepping towards um, the genetic modification of human embryos or even to some extent the genetic modification of other animals or plants. We have to remember that it seems as if there's a progression, but all of a sudden, by the time from the beginning till the end, you may land up in a very different place. It's, it's, it's important also not to throw, as we enter new genetic technologies, not to throw the baby out with the, the genetic bathwater. I mean, it's important to remember that, there's, that our ability to manipulate genes can be very powerful. It has been very powerful.